Hey, everybody. Welcome to Jen Lowry Writes. Okay, guys. I don't even have to say his name. He's here in the studio right now. You know him. This is Kwame Alexander, and what a blessing it is to have Kwame on the show today. Um, I do want to introduce him, though, and give his lovely bio for everyone, just in case you've missed the goodness. That is Kwame. Kwame Alexander is a poet, educator, publisher, and New York Times bestselling author of 35 books, including Swing, there's Swing, Swinging Around, Becoming Muhammad Ali, co-authored with James Patterson, Booked, which was long listed for the National Book Award, Rebound, which was shortlisted for prestigious UK Carnegie Medal, the Caldecott Medal, and Newbery Honor winning picture book, The Undefeated. Please go get that book. Illustrated by Kadir Nelson and his Newbery Medal winning grade novel, The Crossover. And I'm going to tell you why I have the library edition in a minute. A regular contributor to NPR's Morning Edition, Kwame is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award, the Coretta Scott King Author Honor, three NAACP Image Award nominations, and the 2017 inaugural Pat Conroy Legacy Award. In 2018, he founded the publishing imprint Versify and opened the Barbara E. Alexander Memorial Library and Health Clinic in Ghana as part of LEAP for Ghana, an international literacy program he co-founded. He's the writer and executive producer of the crossover TV series on Disney+. Plus. And guys, Kwame, so much and so much more. Just thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you, Jen, for having me. All right. Now, listen, uh -huh. we've, we got to just know all about beginnings with you because, yeah, I can get on there and I can stalk the Internet and I can read all about, you know, how your parents were educators, principal. Your mom was a principal. Your dad was an yep. author. Yep. You were surrounded by books and poetry and you get to college and it hits you. Is that the time when it hit you that you knew you wanted to be a writer? Well, yeah, because two things happened in my sophomore year. I I took a class called organic chemistry. <laughs> there we go. Speaking. And suddenly all my dreams of being a pediatrician went out the window. And then the next thing that happened was I met a woman and I liked her and I but I wasn't very cool. And I needed <laughs> to let her know I was cool. So I went back to the thing I knew, which was literature and words, and I wrote her love poems. And, and she ended up marrying me eventually. Love. So I sort of, you know, so poetry found me. I sort of found my way back to it and it transformed my life. And I realized this is something I think I want to do. And I began to take uh, poetry classes in college um, and literature classes and, and really, and, and Nikki Giovanni was my professor. And, and then it just sort of cemented in me that this is, this is a life, uh, experience. This is a, a, not just a avocation, but a vocation. This is something I want to do. And you were truly called to do this work because not only is it evident in your body of work, but it's in the joy that you bring to the work. Oh, you're like, see, you're making me all blushy now. No, Stop the it. joy is there. Seriously, no matter if you're making, now I'm going to call it a silly video. You're making a silly video on YouTube talking about, here's how you write a haiku and you're writing a haiku to honor your daughter. And it's a silly video. The joy is all over your face. You can feel the love that you have for words with what you do. You know, that comes from my mom. My mom was like, Nine times out of ten, my mom was always smiling, even when she was punishing me. She was <laughs> smiling like she was filled with joy. And so I got that from her. And it's interesting that you bring up the joy because I'm writing my 36th book right now. Oh, tell us. Tell us. And it is it's not just drama. It's some trauma in there, some tragedy. Okay. And I'm trying to figure out how to. How to how to keep how to not keep it mired in tragedy when that is the story and and bring out the joy. And so that's it's been the toughest book I've ever written. And and if I can pull it off, I think I will have done something, you know, pretty marvelous. And the glimmer of hope. 
Yeah, that's Even what it with is. The glimmer, because now no spoiler alerts here, guys. But this is a teacher pick, by the way. Uh, swing. I mm. understand why it's a teacher pick, but you're talking about taking me on a ride and then pulling me down to the depths of like pure despair. Mm -hmm. So, so your books are laced with this trauma, but there yeah. is a thread of hope there. If you look back, I, I mean, let's call them out. I mean, let's yeah. call them. <laughs> you're so you're saying this is the hardest book I've ever well, written. Well, no, I want to is... like shake you and say, wait a minute. Was it swing harder than the crossover or was the crossover harder than swing or Oh, How do you yeah. even quantify that, Kwame? Because they're all hard truths that this is life and life is not pretty. But there is a hope there somewhere in the integrity of man. Wow. I mean, you're right. I hadn't thought about it like that. Um, but you're so right. I think the difference in the project that I'm working on now is the level of inhumanity the de the degree of danger the 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 plethora of hopelessness that exists in this story is it almost appears to be insurmountable it's un it's unlike anything i've ever done but to your point i mean it's life so so and and we make it we're still here so obviously there's some hope and there's some faith and there's some joy that we have because we couldn't exist without it so I've just got to find that that I've got to find that in this story in a way that makes it, you know, palatable and digestible. Um, well, I, yeah. I pray I pray that you will. I Thank have you. faith that you will. But yeah. I'm going to tell you, you write a book, 400 pages, but you write the undefeated. Mm. That is a hard, hard book that is lovely and and truth and needed for all ages, not just a picture book for young children to have conversations with, with their families, but for anyone, any age, the undefeated. So it doesn't matter for me if it's a 400 page exploration into like the depths of, of hard, or if it's a picture book, you do this work and you paint it in a way that truly is relatable for people. You know, I think it's because it's poetry. The poetry it's allows us to enter it and connect with it and, 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 and hear and read about these really heavy topics, but in a way that we can handle it. But it's accessible though. It's right, accessible. Right. And that's exactly. why, and that's exactly. why I've got, okay, so this book sits in our library. So did I you am, borrow that? Did you check that out? I, I did, but I'm okay, going to tell you, I got to take it back soon because it's on a it's on a hold. People are wanting it. They want it. But now, now swing is my personal, um, and I've read so many of of your books. But I brought I brought this for a reason because this has got so many fingerprints of children on it. Right. So many fingerprints of my ninth grade students on it because of the access point when they start with me at the high school, it's, I, I don't want to read. They're, you know, they're reluctant to engage. They're, they're hard, you know, they're, they're hard. And like I said before, you know, I'll start with Sherman Alexi and then I'll say, let's do this book love. You know, we'll pull out the penny kittle and we'll watch the little video that says, why aren't teenagers reading? And we'll take snapshots of how many books have you read for Joey? And there'll be a lot of them that will hold up a zero and they'll stand with their little posters. And I said, now go, let's go take a tour. Now, when you go at the very front of our library, there's multiple copies of the crossover because we have to have multiple copies of your work. And I'm like, grab it, grab it. And then they'll come to me after and they're like, I want to keep this book. Huh. And so then I go and buy the book and I say, do you want to keep this book? There's your book. I, I don't need it back. I don't need it back. You wow. can borrow it for life, wow. borrow it for yes. life because a book that they want to keep, is that is that that book that they say this has got to be a permanent place on my home? Maybe they don't have a bookshelf, but it's in their house. It's in their room. That's the start of something. That's the start of magic of opening up a door for a child. 
Absolutely. And that's what that's what the crossover. That's what you know. We talk about what is the appeal of of the verse. It's like they open it up and say, "Oh, this is doable. I can handle this." If my teacher's gonna make me read for twenty minutes a day, I can make fake this, and then they don't make fake it. They right. they they get sucked in, oh. and they can't they can't stop. And that's the beauty of poetry when it's done right. It just connects with you. It, it it pulls you in. And then you get them. Yep. And you got them for life. I'm a genius. What can I say? I'm telling you. That's what I'm saying. Looking back, though, over the body of your work, here's another thing that I love about your work, too. It's because you don't stay pegged into one box. You've never put yourself into this. Well, I'm a poet and I stay right here just in like love poems or adult work or I'm just doing these collections or I'm doing this short story. Now, I love Crush, the teenage uh, poems. For, uh, yes. I loved Crush. I've read some of the poems to the kids and I'm just like, guys, y'all got to hear this one. Like that's a way to hook kids in, especially like your quick haiku. Like it's like, wow, I could do that. Models, models, Kwame, you are like the model for teachers in the world. <laughs> but, you know, it's not just that. It's acoustic rooster. It's rooster and Mules Davis and Duck Ellington. Yes. And and honestly, for me, animal arc, just the the national, the way that the images are there. When I read animal arc and it's about animal kingdom. To me, I look at it as God's kingdom. When mm. I read that, I look at, I don't know, it even transcends me away from thinking about this animal exhibiting this. How are we as people exhibiting this? Like I even carry a picture book about animal art. I love it. A, yeah, because it there's something about your work that transcends the page. And then the reader has an experience with your work. Well, that's how I experience the world. I look at it through the lens of poetry, you know, whether it's animals or, you know, jazz music or baseball or, you know, um, the state of, uh, of our country. I always see it through poetry because I feel like it's the best way to, you know, to understand the world in a way that, um, like you said, is accessible and engaging and entertaining and ultimately empowering. That's what the poetry does for me. It's always done that since I was a kid. And so looking back, like your process of sitting in front and honoring the stories as they come, mm -hmm. like even just with like with swing. Right. And, oh, I just want to breathe. Guys, y'all got to go get that book, too. Like you got to get them all. But um, even just with with that book. You know, you take us through baseball, you take us through art, you take us through jazz. You're mentioning all these things. You and you know, you embody so much of youth into a book. And you show youth as an example of they're more than just, you know, a stereotype. Right. They, they're more than that. And you honor youth in your work. I still feel like I'm a big kid, you know, and. I want to write the kind of book that I would have wanted to have read when I was a teenager and that I would love, I will love now. And I, I want to be true to myself. I want to write about kids, you know, in the way that I see them because I still feel like I'm a part of that world. I'm tapped into that. Um, I wrote that book with a really good friend of mine, Mary Rand Hess. Um, and she is, you know, just a dynamic writer. And so, we outlined the story together and and then we sort of set off and and she wrote some chapters i wrote some chapters and maybe she then wrote a hundred pages and then i went back and rewrote those hundred pages and then maybe i wrote 50 pages and and she rewrote those and then we had like 600 pages like screwed out all over the floor as it were and it's like a puzzle putting the pieces together so it flows like a story. Um, we didn't know it was gonna end the way it was gonna end when we started writing it. That came in the middle of the process and when it did, it sort of knocked us on off of our feet. We were like, whoa, this story has completely changed. It was a love story. And now it's something more, it's something more necessary and important, especially right now. And still a love story. 
And still a love a story. A love story. A story of love between the best of friends. Yes. Between a trio, between a brother and his, between brothers. Yeah. It is such a love story. Yes, indeed. I just wrote, uh, Mary and I just finished writing the movie Swing. So, so you yeah. see the look on my face. The movie. Sorry. Yeah, right. Right. How is how is that transitioning over to write for the crossover TV series mm -hmm. to to the movies? Like, how is that for you? Is it easy? Is it? It's a lot easier. For real. Lot, oh my gosh, writing TV and film is is a lot easier than writing a novel. And and the cool thing is, once you've written a novel, then to take that story and adapt it for the screen the smaller the big screen is even easier because you have all the stuff there you you you, you can't include everything so it's like cutting it's easier to cut away than it is to add the the problem is that uh or, or the good thing is that when you're writing a novel in verse there's so much dialogue and so much sort of narrative storytelling already built in that you can use that in the script it's really an incredible process I see that. I see that because if you're writing a full length novel, then you've got to, you know, you've got all that description and you've got all of that scene set up and all that build. But you get to, you know, page by page, take us on that journey. Yep. Then and we fill in all the blanks. That's yeah. that's giving the respect back to the reader to fill in all of the blanks. Right. And that's another thing that poetry does. Yep. There, there aren't a whole lot of words. There's a lot of white space on the page because the reader has to do some of the work and the reader wants to do some of the work, even if they don't know they're doing it, they're a part of it. That white space is for the spiritual journey that the reader takes. And so poetry becomes, it's not just about the words that are on the page, it's about the words that aren't there too. Oh that yes. Tell the story. Oh yes, and you do that again, like I say, so well. I mean, of course you know. I mean, when you first started receiving notifications of awards coming in for your work, Mm -hmm. How was that in your beginnings? Oh, it was life changing. Like, you know, you write a book in the hopes that somebody's going to read it and be inspired or in entertained. You know, they're going to enjoy it. You don't expect to win awards. And then you find out that you not only won an award, but you won the biggest award in children's yes. literature. And it just it changes your life like, you know, um, creatively it just it puts a lot of pressure on you now and it and, and you and it builds a lot of confidence in you at the same time um it creates a lot of opportunities for kids to, to have access to your books and it creates a lot of opportunities for you to write more books and get published it's really a life-changing sort of experience and then of course the, the other thing it does is like that pressure you begin to think with every book ah oh, this book has got to be great you know, I got, I got, a, I got a certain bar I've set. So, you know, that, that's a hard sort of place to be in. Um, but, but I wouldn't trade it. I love it. I see it as a sense of freedom within. Yeah. The world. Yeah. I because mean, it's, it's like winning a championship, you know, you, you win the world series or you win an NBA championship or you win the, the Super Bowl and, or a Grammy or an Oscar. And then after that, it's, it's like you, 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 you're in the pantheon and, with the next thing you hope to win again. So you, that doesn't change like, well, let's do it again. So, so it's, it's that kind of pressure, but it's cool. I, I love it. When you first started all of this, did you expect international literacy foundations and, and organization and, and working that route? Had you always had that on your radar to give back in that way? Oh yeah. Cause I was doing it before all this happened. I'll talk. So talk. Oh, Tell yeah. that. Yeah. So, so I mean, in 2010, I won the Newbury in 2015. Right. right. Uh, the crossover wasn't published until 2014. Yeah, My first children's book wasn't published until 2012. Yeah, that was Acoustic Rooster, right? Acoustic Rooster. Yeah. yeah. So in, in 2010, I was self-publishing my own books. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any acclaim. I didn't. Nobody knew who I was. And I had applied to this fellowship in Brazil to go and study for three months and write and live on the beach free. And I just knew this was, you know, I had written like four, 
12 books. I felt like I was, I felt like I was the man. Like I, <laughs> I had a great recommendation. I think Maya Angelou gave me a recommendation. And Nikki Giovanni gave me a recommendation. So I believed I should get this fellowship. And I remember not, I got the letter and I didn't get it. And I was devastated. They were like, maybe apply again next year or in two years. I was like, what? No, I want this now. I need this. And, and so I remember being sad and, and a little in a funk. And then I was like, no, Kwame, you can't let other people define who you are. You gotta, you, you want to do a fellowship, do a fellowship. And so I created a fellowship. I called it the Kwame Alexander International Fellowship. And I, I sent letters to nine writer educators that I knew around the country. And I said, you're the recipient of a Kwame Alexander International Fellowship. They didn't, they didn't apply. I said, it's, <laughs> I said, I said you're, gonna, you're gonna spend three weeks in a villa in Tuscany. And I had done some research and had a friend over there and she helped me find a villa. And I said, all expense paid, you just have to get there. And we're gonna write for three weeks. And I, and people were calling me, writing letters back, like, wow, this is happening. I'm like, yeah. Now I didn't have any money to pay for it, but I went out and I worked my butt off and I raised the money to be able to pay for this villa and the chef and everything. And that was in the fall of, that was in the summer of 2010. And we were in the villa and we were in Tuscany, nine of us. And, and it was about me giving an opportunity to other writers, but it was also about me having that experience that I knew I craved and I needed. And that was the beginning for me of this sort of creative journey that I've been on that's been sort of just, it's been like a rocket. It's just, it's been, a, it's, it's, it's been galvanizing. And that was before I had anything. So I've always thought that I was the greatest, that I was the man, even when I wasn't, you know? So, hey, that confidence has worked. Let's just say that confidence has worked, but you know, that selflessness, like being so, like putting others before you too in this process and that form of giving, right. then you got it back tenfold. Ten, twentyfold. Twentyfold. I'm a 26 year overnight success, Jen. Love it. I love it. With, the thing about you, though, too, you know, you have the library now and the health center. Mm -hmm. You have that established. When, what year was that for you that you knew, okay, I'm going to take this writing place to this next level and do access to literacy and health? Well, yeah, it was 2012. It's when I first went to Ghana in West yes. Africa. And way before, way before. The it was goal. Way before that. Um, so I, I think the library that we opened in 2000, in the fall of 2012, was a closet in a room in the village. And we had, a, you know, I had collected donations, maybe had about 500 books. And that was it. It was just a closet. We cleaned it out, you know, built bookshelves with, with the, some of the men in the, in the village helped us build bookshelves. And that was the library. And you fast forward to 2018, six years later. And this full, you know, like 2,000 square foot, 5,000 books on the shelf library with computer center, health clinic opened up, you know? So that was a pretty, and I named it after my mom who had passed away the year before, who was my first librarian, who, who taught me everything I knew about, you know, words and stories. Um, and so, yeah. I've got some things I want to do now. Like I've got, I've got something big in the works that I, that's going to be, this is another part of the dream coming true. And I'm really excited. But you can tell the joy, <laughs> the love, and, and, the, and now you got me hanging off the side of the seat. I here. will say this. I will say this. It's, 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 uh, it's a place for writers that I'm building. And He's doing a writing retreat, y'all. I'm doing not saying anything retreat. else. I'm not saying anything else. Maybe, maybe. Who knows? All I know, in... it's going to be inspiring. It's going to be encouraging. It's uh -huh. going to be an uplifting place where people can find their true voice. And it's going to be in the United States. Okay. And I need what to write that down because you just said it. You just said everything that I want. Well, don't I ask me to repeat it because I have <laughs> You'll have to watch the video again and play it back. Yes. All right. So look, when you go back to edit and you watch this video, <laughs> write that down and email it to me because I, I, I need that. 
but it's true though because there is this authenticity about you everything feels so real when you step into your work and it's because it's just an extension of your heart my father says you'll never get in trouble if you just be yourself and it's just always be yourself it's there it's there now jen jen what do you write Oh, I'm a multi-genre author too. And I told you that's why I respect that you're not in that box and you don't allow the world or the industry to define you as that you are a children's book author in the picture right. book world and you right. need to stay in this one little lane. Like you explore the story and then you share it. And yes, I know poetry is your form of expression. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a poet too. But I just wrote a serial killer cult book that's coming out in August. And so what? that's my first thriller. I know. I you know. You say that with such joy and just happiness. I must, I've written a serial <laughs> killer book. Like, really? Hey. No, when they say that. Hey, I love Heather Moody. She's my detective. She's on it. You know, I honor my aunt. She got the name. It's, it's my family name. It's, it's coming out August 31st. Like, What's the title of it? The Sunday Killer. Everybody, we're going to go out and get a shot. We're going to pre-order the Sunday Killer. Right, as soon as you finish watching and listening to this podcast, order the Sunday Killer. I'm going to do it literally right now. While it's, not it's not on pre-order. It's not on pre-order. It's not on pre-order. No, the publishing company has not put it out. It just went through its final line. It's in line edits right now. We're out. We're out. But right. it's coming soon, Kwame. I'll let you Sunday know. Killer. I'm gonna Sunday Killer. I'm going to get it. Sunday Killer. Sunday Killer. Yeah. I, I just honor that page. Yeah, you got to. Because the page, because the page will will honor you and honor us, and it honors that place too, where like the vocation comes, the calling comes. That's it. Because if if we press ourselves into the place, then we're forcing something that wasn't meant to be out there in the world. Right. Look at you. No, you but it's true. But Kwame, to me, when I read your work it feels like just this natural flow of water. It's like water. It's just truth. It's just, it's I'm, just I'm bearing my soul, my truth. My goal is to make my personal your business. But, I, and so I gotta be willing to take risk. I gotta got be willing to dance naked on the floor. I gotta be willing to just, and not care whether you like it or not. I just gotta be willing to put myself out there and be honest and open and true, truthful and, 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 and authentic and just be real about it. And be be entertaining because it's not gonna, it's, it's going to be fruitless if it's not a page turner, right? You know. But when you do it though, when you release that that water that flow, and it and it comes out in this form, you've got hard, hard truths, hard hurts. There are mm -hmm. hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always guy gets girl. It's not always working out you know everything's perfect there's it's truth wow you and know, it gives it gives students stuff it gives kids it gives adults you know here i am 45 year old woman loving your mess you see what i'm saying and then you've got these the youth though that have access then they don't know what they're getting themselves into right and then when they get there it causes you to pause to reflect, to question, to say, where I, where am I in this kind of universe? Where am I in this kind of space? How can I make sense of this? Because even if it's not happening to me, it's happening. Right. Even if it's not my world, it's happening to someone's world. And I can relate to the character. Like there's something about this person that I can, I see myself in them. Like this happens to me. Like my parents are, have gotten divorced or I play soccer or, you know, or I want to be cool. You know, like there's something about these characters that are universal. And that's what I've always believed that at the end of the day, it's not, it may sound cliche, but we are all human beings. Who did you, you just know? sound like? You just quoted Harper Lee at To Kill a Mockingbird when Scout says, folks, we just folks. We just folks. Jim said there's four types of people and Scout told brother, no, we're just, we folks. Yeah. It's the he, truth. Punched, he punched that pillar, made him mad because he said, well, if we're just folks, then why? Why do we treat each other the way we treat each other? Yeah. If we're just folks. Mm. I used to think that and you haven't lost that, Kwame. I haven't lost that. No, not at all. I walk through life, you know, believing that. And if other people don't, that's their problem. I can't allow them to sort of define my 
humanity for me. But that's that's if you got issues, though, that's on you. That that's not me. And so that's when I like to kill a bunker. That's a book that matters. When you look at your work, your work matters mm -hmm. because they're just folks living, breathing, experiencing, hurting, crying, laughing, <laughs> going to a Dairy Queen for advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, the love doctor. I mean, you want to, you want to crack somebody up. I'll never look at a Dairy Queen the same. Like I will never, I'm going to go by the Dairy Queen, never see it. The same. But that's what the power of words does. It pulls you in and it allows you to feel so many types of ways, so right. many types of emotions and you don't know which way to go. And then when it's all done, you look back and you can just say, wow, just say, wow. Wow. And then how do I fit? How does this fit? And how does that help someone else? How can I listen? How can I be a better person? Yep. It's how can I contribute? Because that's what it's about. It's, it's about what can you offer to, to the universe is, is conspiring to give you everything that you want. What are you doing what kind of work are you putting in? What are you offering? What are you giving? That's, 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 to me, that becomes the purpose of, that's what makes you happy. Ultimately, that's what makes you, that's what, that's what fills you. It's, it's to be able to offer something to someone. You know, that's what does it. It's the giving. And to offer words is not a small thing. To offer words, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. It's it's a life changing thing. Yeah. I, tell I, me, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna ask you. Tell me about this publishing company switch. What switch? Well, Versify, the imprint. What was that about? That's in I, your bio sitting there. Well, two things about that. Uh, first, I wanted to create opportunities for other writers just like uh, just like me. Writers who hadn't had a chance, didn't get, you know, who got rejected, who had a story to tell, but didn't know how to break into the industry, who, you know, were writing stories and, and publishing their own books and selling them at the farmer's markets like I was. Just wanted to give an opportunity to writers out there who weren't, con who, who weren't connected. You know, I felt like so many, you know, Publishers, we generally publish people we like or people we know. And if you don't have a community of people that really looks and reflects America, then the same people are getting published over and over. And so that's why it took me forever to get published. I had to sort of knock down doors. I want to make it easier for other writers to get in the door. And so that's why I started Versify. Um, but I'm no longer publishing books with Versify. Um, my, oh. contra my contract um, expired in October and we wanted to continue it and we couldn't come to terms, frankly. Okay, okay. You know, this, I, this, it's in that bio, so y'all yeah, scratch that out. Yeah, this, this business, this biz it's a business. Publishing yeah. is a business. And, and after three years, we published some amazing books and you know, great authors like Lamar Giles and Raul Third and and Amy Lucido and Sophia Pasternak, and we won a bunch of awards. And I look at it when when the contract didn't extension didn't work out. I sort of felt like, man, this is, it felt like a divorce. It felt hard and harsh, and I was. And then I realized, okay, maybe this isn't a divorce. Maybe this is the kid going off to college, and I just got to let it go. And it just so happens that my kid is a prodigy and went to college a little early. Aww. So it's all good. So I love the metaphor there. And so, so now that you've got all these other things in the work though, like yeah. it gives you that opportunity to focus and do your next best thing. Like, like this big insp inspirational question mark, the question big mark. question mark out yes. there. Yes. But you know, you talked about like rejection. Like, imagine now looking back and when you first tried to pitch the crossover and somebody saying, maybe girls wouldn't like that book or yep. maybe this verse isn't working and this isn't going to be, you know, 
the fly book of the year. I mean, <laughs> looking back at those moments, she didn't give up on that story. I've never given up on anything. I see. Um, my favorite quote is, I am the greatest, not because I am better than anyone, but because no one is better than me. And so I go through life believing that I matter. And I get sad when I when other people don't think I matter. Yeah, I get sad, but I don't let it upend me. I don't let it ruin me. I don't let it destroy me because ultimately I am going to be in charge of my own destiny. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say yes to life. And eventually you're going to say yes. And by you saying yes to life, by you living true to yourself, you're setting such a model for your children. Oh yeah. Cause my kid is 12 years old and she's, a, she's about to be 13. And she says, Oh my God, she's a yes. She says no to me and yes to herself a lot. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's interesting. But you're teaching her yeah, that's how to become. Right, right. And that's what it's all about. How do we become who we're supposed to be? And, uh, and that, that's the journey. And so her looking at you and all this success, what has she said to you? Not very much about it. I mean, she's a 12 year old. She doesn't say anything to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> she's in her own life. She's in her own world. I mean, yeah. I have a 13 year old. I'm with you. you get I have it. a 13 year old. Yep. You get it. But yeah. she's, a, she's, she, she's a big supporter and she, she reads a lot of my stuff and gives me a bunch of notes. So she's, she's, <laughs> I love it. she's a gem. Love it so much. Yeah. So I just I want to tell you, thank you for what you do. You're with very, all, with all of the fill in the blanks of the things that you do, you, you, you've got your writing programs out there. You talk about sparking imagination and allowing children to find their own voices. Talk a little bit about the, the writing programs. You've got so much. You've got your writing workshop books. You've got your programs. How did all that come to be? Um, I'm an educator at heart. I've always believed that my writing was a tool to be able to help young people imagine a better world. I not only want to write books that are enjoyable and entertaining and empowering, but I want to in, in, inspire kids to write their own stories to write their lives and so you know i've always sort of you know created workshops and 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 different sort of strategies to help teachers teach writing and to help young people learn how to write and to do it in a really cool way because i feel like i'm the cool guy to do it but it's because you're pouring life into children by saying, I believe you have a voice. I know you have a voice. And once they believe it, they start to use it. And then watch out world. Like, watch out world. And it's because you start with saying, I believe. I know. And then they show it. And so those programs just open up new worlds new opportunities, self-confidence, just so much. And for them to say, wait, I do have a voice. What I say, someone will read this. I, it does matter what I say. And the more, what, we, the more we speak, the world, the world changes. That's what writing does. Yeah. And that, that, that's ultimately why I write. And I think, you know, yeah, I mean, just listening to you, I, you, you said I'm full of joy. You're full of joy too. Like I love your joy. Like I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to go right now. I got, in fact, I know what I'm going to work on as soon as we finish this. I'm good. This is what I needed. Thank you. Yes. For this. Hey, thank you for this because you pour life back into me by saying yes, because you said yes to be here with a teacher who writes some books on the side, loves her job, loves talking about books all day. Loves working with other authors to help them find their voice. You know, we're well, doing the same work. You're you're just a you know you're a lot more elevated in your spaces. 
but we're, we're doing the work. We're doing the word, the words that matter in well, our own spaces. Last thing I want to say today is the following. People out there, folks, I'm Kwame Alexander, and I'm going to tell you one thing. That is, listen to Jen Lowry writes and go and get the Sunday killer <laughs> on August the 31st. You heard it here first. It's going to be the serial killer book of the century. Trust me. I don't even know how it ends, but the ending is crazy. Trust me on this. It actually is a little crazy. So uh, definitely, I'm going to send you a free copy, Kwame. So don't go hit a buy button. You'll get it. I'll send you an early arc. I just got the early arcs ready. So Y'all heard, y'all heard it here. <laughs> I'm going to get an arc. It's going to come to my penthouse in London. It's coming. Oh, man. So guys, listen. First, you've got 35 books to choose from. You might as well just buy them all. You might as well get them all. You could do like me. I found you through the crossover. That was my first book that I read. And I'm telling you, your children's books, I've, I've done it. I've read them. I've read your poetry. I've read. It's there. It's live for me. Like, I'm a live fan of your work. I can't wait for number 36. I can't wait to see that hard and that hope crash together somewhere on a page. And then I hit that moment where I say, this is where love lives. And it'll come. It'll crash. I know it. I have all the faith in the world that it'll find its way because it does in all of your work. It finds its way there. Just trust that process and it'll get there. Well, from your lips, my friend, with, with, the, with just the right amount of grace. Yes, right. The right amount of grace. That's it. So, guys, where can you be found? Kwame, tell the world how to connect with you. Where do you kind of hang out most in this world? I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, it's at Kwame Alexander on Twitter and Instagram and Kwame Alexander Books on Facebook. So go and check out his website. Uh, you can get a lot of information there. He's got resources for teachers. He's got all of his books there. The bio. I love the kid-friendly bio. Share it with your classes. He's got videos all over YouTube. Your read aloud of The Undefeated brought tears to my eyes. Mm. I've read The Undefeated on my own, but having that opportunity where you were on live television with a studio audience and you read The Undefeated, that's a different experience hearing an author read their own work. And so grab the undefeated for your students plus your family and then have Kwame read along with you so you can have that total experience. But Kwame, just thank you so much for being here. I could talk forever, but I just want to say how much, you know, my family to your family, just thank you for everything that you do for the work. You're very welcome, my friend. And thank you for having me. All right. Bye, guys.